everyone, and welcome to the What's New in Test Complete 8.1 webinar. My name is Nick Olivo, and over the course of the next 40 minutes or so, we're going to look at many of the new and exciting features in the latest version of Test Complete. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. First of all, we are recording this session, and you'll be receiving a link to that recording later on this week or early next week. Second, we will be having a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. I'll try to field some questions real time as well, but rest assured, if you have a Test Complete 8.1 question, it will be addressed. Now, many of you have been on webinars and demos with me before, so you know that I don't believe in doing a whole lot with PowerPoint. So let's dive right into Test Complete. All right, so I've got Test Complete loaded here. And the first thing that I want to mention is that we've made some changes to the Create New Project wizard. So let's start out with that. Let's click Create New Project. And now the first dialog in the wizard is similar to what you're used to. You can put in a project name and location. But when you click this More button, you can also rename the project suite. And you can note exactly where the project PJS file will be stored. So you're never going to be left wondering, hey, where do the, these files get placed? All right, so I'm going to take the defaults here and click Next. Now, this next screen is brand new. Here we can specify what sort of application we're testing. And let's do a quick rundown of the types of apps you can choose from. Your generic Windows applications, that's your, your C++, your Delphi, your VB, those kinds of things. Uh, web is if you're doing functional web testing or web services testing or uh, certain applications like Silverlight or JavaFX. Adobe Air is a brand new environment we're supporting with Test Complete 8.1. And you can also test Java or Windows CE applications. All right, so for our purposes today, I'm going to choose Adobe Air. Now, one thing that I need to mention here is if you're doing Adobe Air or Silverlight, those need to be properly compiled in order for Test Complete to recognize objects within those applications. And when I say properly compiled, what I mean are some special files that we ship with Test Complete that you need to include in order to give Test Complete the ability to properly recognize the application's internals. So uh, with uh, with Air, it's an SWC file that you need to include. With Silverlight, it's a little patch utility that you need to run. And these basically just grant Test Complete the ability to see farther into the application and see all the internal uh, objects and methods and whatnot in those applications. Okay, the help file itself contains information on how to do that. So just look in the help topics for preparing Silverlight or preparing Air applications, and you'll get a step-by-step -step set of instructions on how to do that. Okay, so now what I want to do is select the application that I want to actually create my test for. So to do that, I'm going to click this Add EXE button. And the application I want to work with is right here. It says orders.exe, so I'm just going to select that. You'll also notice we've got this Auto Run column now, and that box is checked. What this means is when we start recording, Test Complete will automatically invoke this application. So we don't need to go to the Start menu or double-click on a shortcut or anything like that. Test Complete will automatically kick off that application. All right, and we also have this Record User Action Over Tested Applications Only. If you've ever been recording a test and an instant message comes in, or a Skype call pops up, or an email comes through, and you stop and respond to that, and then you realize later, oh shoot, Test Complete recorded me you know, recorded that one time or one sided at conversation, uh, that's not good. So here you can check this box and Test Complete will only record those applications that you've uh, defined as tested apps. All right, so I'm going to click Next here. And this final screen allows you to specify what scripting language you're going to work with. It's the same five languages you all know and love. And in my case here, I'm going to pick JScript because, hey, JavaScript is just my favorite. Okay, so now my application, or excuse me, my project has been created, so I'm ready to record a new test. So I'm just going to click the Record New Test button, and Test Complete's going to minimize down, and it's going to automatically invoke my orders application for me. So I won't need to double-click a shortcut, won't need to go to the Start menu. There it is. The app just pops up for me automatically. And now I can perform my test as normal. So I'm going to uh, click on this New Order button, and now here's something else I want to show you. You'll notice that Test Complete is saying, hey, this application should be recompiled because it's not using the most current version of that SWC file that I mentioned earlier. So uh, I'm using an older version right now, and Test Complete is saying, hey, there's a new one available. If your application hasn't been compiled properly at all, if it doesn't have those files, then that message will also pop up. So this is a nice way to remind you that, hey, Test Complete's not going to be able to give you as much access as it could unless you compile the application properly. 
But let's go ahead and I'm just going to record my test as normal now. Let's say I want the uh, screensaver product, and I'll put in my customer name, good old Barry Allen, and we'll give Barry a uh, street address of uh, 1 my street, and we'll put him in, uh, what state will he go in? He'll go in Massachusetts, and we'll give him credit card number 1. All right, and then I'll click OK. And I'm going to stop recording. And when I stop recording, TestComplete is going to process the actions just like normal. But it's also going to pop up this message that says, hey, this application should be compiled in order to give full access to all the error objects. And you can just push this uh, help button right here and uh, automatically uh, see exactly what's involved in the uh, compilation process. Okay. And just like what you're used to seeing in a regular uh, Windows application or web application, Test Complete is now showing you all the controls that you clicked. We have visualizer images associated with each one of these things, and all the controls, again, are being recognized based on their actual names as opposed to you know, screen coordinates or XY locations or things like that. Okay. Now, similar stuff has also been done, like I said, for Silverlight-based applications. And again, just like what we did for the Air application, you will need to have um, your Silverlight app compiled properly. But once you do, you can use Test Complete's Object Spy or Recorder in order to take a peek at any one of the internals inside your Silverlight application. So I've got um, this little uh, sample Silverlight application right here, which is just a uh, uh, music player. I had a hard time figuring out what this was called for a second there. Brain cramped up on me. Um, and Test Complete will now allow us to inspect the controls inside this application just like it would normally. Um, and when we view these objects, you'll be able to see the actual um, you know, names of the controls as specified by the developers along with all of the uh, methods, fields, and properties that the developer would normally have access to. So I've got a little bit of a lag going on here, um, but we will tweak that right now, and hopefully Test Complete will come back. Um, so yeah, and plus Test Complete now supports Silverlight 4. That's the other thing I want to mention uh, while we're here, so that you know if you guys are working on the bleeding edge of rich internet applications, Test Complete will be able uh, to help you out. Okay, and Test Complete seems to have frozen up on me, so bear with me for one moment, folks. I'm going to uh, do a quick end task and then bring this right back and we'll go from there. Okay, so relaunch test complete and then we will continue on. Now, a um, couple of other things that uh, we can talk about while we're waiting for that to happen. Uh, we have included a bunch of new environments inside of our, uh, inside the new version of test complete so that we can uh, now work with things like Java 7 type applications. We can work with Adobe Air, like I mentioned. Um, we can work with Silverlight 4. We can also, um, <coughs> excuse me, we can also integrate in with new versions of Perforce, so Perforce 2009 and 2010, for those of you out there who are working with those kinds of applications. All right, now, I'm going to go ahead and, and bring this back. Um, a couple of other things I want to mention about the keyword test editor. We've had some changes that have been made to that. And let's say that during the course of our testing, we have generated this little text report that you see on my screen right now, which contains a list of all the customers that are in our application. Um, normally, we'd want to create a file checkpoint in order to verify that this information was correct. So let's go ahead and, and let's do that. The process to create a checkpoint is exactly the same as it's always been. You click on the checkpoint slider bar right here, and then you click on the file checkpoint button, and just drag it right on to the test. Now the first thing you're going to notice that's different is we've got this little red arrow now, which is telling you exactly where the checkpoint's going to be inserted in your test. So there's no more guessing about, am I putting this at the right spot? Is it going too high? Is it going too low? Am I on the wrong operation? Now Test Complete will show you exactly where a particular element's going to be inserted in the keyword test editor. So I'm just going to go ahead and drop that on there. Now the process to create the file checkpoint is exactly the same. You specify which file you want to work with. In my case, it's going to be this customerList.txt file. Click Next. And then we will store off a copy of that file as a baseline for later comparison. 
Okay, now we've got our checkpoint ready. But we've made some nice little changes to the file checkpoint itself. Um, normally, when we created the checkpoint and ran it, we would just get a message at the end that said the checkpoint you know, failed and that the files don't match. Now we've actually enhanced the checkpoint so that it will tell you exactly what's different. So let me go ahead and, and illustrate that. Let's say that instead of Mark Twain, we're expecting to find Sam Clemens, and we also have another uh, author in here, good old Robert Jordan. All right, I'm going to save this, and I'm going to run my checkpoint. So now Test Complete's going to go and it's going to compare those two files and it'll tell me exactly uh, if those two items are the same or if they're different and then what exactly is different about them if so. So here we go, our checkpoint has run, it's finished out, and now here we go, we've got our, our message that is saying, okay, first and foremost, the checkpoint failed. Okay, that's important to know. Then we've got this item right here that says file comparison result. So I'm going to click on this details link. And what this is showing us, and let me uh, select the panel here, is exactly what the baseline file contained, you see that on the left side of the screen, versus what's in the live file, which is what you see on the right. So the elements that are highlighted in green are a line that contains similar characters, but uh, don't match up exactly. And then the line that's in light blue on the right is showing you a line that is not present in the baseline file. So now there's no ambiguity about what's different between your uh, actual and your expected tests. All right, so let's say now that this checkpoint is failing on a regular basis because of an issue in our report uh, generation process. You know, when our developers come back and they say, you know what, guys, it's going to be a week or two before we get around to fixing that. So instead of always finding this failure in your test over and over again and then just ignoring it, Test Complete now has the ability to selectively disable various items inside the keyword test editor. So, you know, if you've ever worked in scripting languages, you know that you can comment items out if you don't want them to run. You can do the same thing now. You just right click on the item you want to disable, and then you select enable slash disable operations from the uh, context menu that gets displayed. So when you do that, you'll notice that the checkpoint name itself has turned a lighter gray. That means that Test Complete will skip over that particular uh, action and you know it won't post any failures uh, when that uh, test runs. And then we can re-enable it again just by right clicking and choosing uh, Enable Disable Operation. So a really handy way for you to just skip out a few pieces uh, during your tests. All right, now uh, we've talked about what's new in the file checkpoint. But we've also made changes to what's happening in the region checkpoint as well. And I'm willing to bet that some of you out there have created region checkpoints at one time or another and said, geez, I wish I could just easily exclude one little piece of this image. You know, like, let's look at this uh, website right here. You can see that if I wanted to create a checkpoint to see if this page was laid out properly, I'm going to run into trouble because we have this date timestamp inside our web page and every time I run that test I'm gonna get a failure in the region checkpoint because that area of the screen is different well we've made it possible now so that you can exclude areas of an image from a comparison so here let's walk through how to do that again you're gonna come back into the checkpoint area just like you always did and we're gonna say region checkpoint again you can see that little arrow there is telling me I can put it above the file checkpoint below the file checkpoint wherever I want we'll just put it afterwards for right now now I'm going to select the item on screen I want to create the checkpoint for using the Finder tool, and I'm going to just choose this page object right here. Okay, I've got that selected. And, you know, the process is exactly the same. We're going to capture a reference to that object. We'll click Next. All right. This image is what's going to get stored off. It's going to be stored with this name, form, login form. I'm going to change that to Welcome Page because I want this to be a little bit more descriptive and I'll spell welcome page correctly, that'll be helpful as well. There we go. Okay, click next. Now, one thing that's different here, we've always had the ability to select pixel tolerances and color tolerances, but now we've got these slider bars that you can use to quickly set the values uh, to a desired uh, range just by clicking on the slider bar here. Uh, for right now, though, I'm just going to take the defaults and click next. And now here's where we can really uh, create those 
exclusions. The, what we're going to do is create what's called a comparison mask. So what we want to do is click this Create New Comparison Mask button. Okay? And now I'm going to use my Zoom In button that you see right here to come in a little closer to my, my web page. And now here's that area I want to omit from the comparison. So I'm going to click on this rectangle button right here, select rectangle area, and I'm going to draw a box around the area I want to exclude from the comparison. Okay, and you can see right there, I have drawn that box, so we've selected the element that's going to be changing every time the test runs. Okay, once we've got that done, then we click the exclude selected area from comparison button, this little red minus sign. And when I do that, you see the test complete basically deletes it out of the image that we're storing off. All right, and we click finish. Okay, now our checkpoint has been created. Okay, so now just to show how that's going to work, we'll come in here, I'm going to refresh my page. All right, you see that when we created that checkpoint, it was around 2.17 in the afternoon. Now it's 2.21. So this should fail, but it won't because of our mask. So let's go ahead. We're going to run that checkpoint. And test complete will come right back and say, yes, that checkpoint was successful. Here we go. We get the message saying that the region checkpoint passed. And if you come down here to the actual and expected images, you can see that even though the date and time stamps are different, that the checkpoint itself was passing. But now there's a skeptic out there among you who's saying, well, Nick, how do we know that the rest of the thing actually passed? Okay, so let's do that. I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to make a change here. Let's fill in some, some characters inside that username field, and we'll rerun the checkpoint. And you'll see that the checkpoint will fail because the string AAAA was not expected in the original image, and that part was not masked out. So you'll be able to uh, see that the checkpoint did fail. I've got a question here from uh, Avram who's asking, can you do multiple regions, multiple exclusions within a checkpoint? The answer is yes to that, absolutely. We could skip out you know, three or four different pieces of our uh, region if we wanted to. All right, now we got a message saying that the checkpoint failed. Okay, here's our actual image and our expected image. And if we use our comparison button to see exactly what's different, you can see here that the AAA is what's different in the, in the images, and you'll also notice we have this gray strip right here. That's the image mask, so we can see exactly which pieces of the image were being ignored when the uh, checkpoint was actually performed. So this is a really handy feature if you've got things like date timestamps, if you've got rolling banner graphics, if you've got things like this that uh, you know are always changing on a web page or within any application, really, um, and you want to exclude, exclude those from the comparisons, this is a great way uh, to do that. All right, now, uh, one other thing I want to mention here, going back to our test, is if you look here in the description column in our uh, keyword test, let me go ahead and I'm going to actually zoom in on this a little bit for you guys. We've enhanced the information that's being displayed in the description column. So right now, for our file checkpoint, you see that uh, we're comparing the customer list stores item with c colon backslash customer list dot txt. And for the region checkpoint, we're comparing the welcome page store item with the, uh, you know, this object that's currently displayed on screen. So there's no more ambiguity about what a particular checkpoint is doing. If you've got somebody who's brand new uh, to test complete or brand new to your application, and they're not sure about what a particular test is doing, they can see exactly what's being verified here by looking in the description panel. All right. Okay, so now I want to talk about an easier way to store data in variables when you're working with keyword tests. In fact, I'm sure that many of you at one time or another have wondered, how do I just capture a value on screen and store that in a variable? You know, this I can't figure out how to do that. All right. Well, we've added a new feature into the set variable command that makes this process really easy. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to jump back into my stock trader site here and I'm going to log in. It's good old John Smith, the super secret password of pass123, and here we are. Let's say that I want to capture this value, this cash balance value, and store that in a variable for later use in my test. Previously, you had to do you know, some, either some coding or you had to know a, the right object syntax in order to do this. We've made this a whole lot easier in TestComplete 8.1. So here's how you do it. First thing you want to do is actually 
create your variable. So I've just clicked on the variables tab here in my test. I'm going to right click, say new item. I'm going to call my variable something a little more descriptive. We'll call it balance. And click save. Okay, so now I've created my variable. Now I want to set that variable equal to one of those values on screen. So I'm going to come into this operations palette. I'm going to type the word set. Grab the set variable value command that gets displayed, and I'm just going to drag that right onto my test. Okay. And now test complete says, okay, we're going to set a variable value. Which variable are we working with? We'll choose the balance variable that we just created a moment ago. No problem there. Click next. Okay, now here's where that new feature has been implemented. We want to set a value for the variable. So we're going to click in the mode drop down here and I'm going to choose object property. And once I've got object property selected, I'm going to click on this little ellipses right next to the value field right here. And that's going to bring up this little wizard and says, okay, what kind of object property are we working with? Are we doing something uh, that's actually on screen right now? Are we working with a process? Or do you want to pick something from the name map? So we're going to say on screen object and click next. Now, this select object property dialog that comes up next, this is exactly the same thing as what you're used to with the property checkpoint wizard. So I'm going to use the finder tool here. I'm just going to drag that right over the cash balance value right here. And when I've got that red box drawn around the cash balance value, I'm going to release the mouse. And now test complete is going to capture a reference to that control, again, just like always, using the actual name of the control as specified by the developers. Okay, so there it is. There's my, my control that I want to work with. Got that, and I'm going to click next. And now here's a list of all the properties that we could use for the, the variable. Any one of these properties we could take and store in the variable. So just like what you're used to with the property checkpoint. So I'm going to scroll through here and I am going to choose the inner text property because that actually has that $100,000 value. So I'm going to select that and click finish. And then we click finish in the set variable value dialog. And bang, there we go. Now we're going to take that variable and we are going to store the value that's currently in that text control properties inner text and use that later on. So much easier now to set a variable value in a keyword test. All right. Now, let's shift gears for a minute and talk about a new feature that we have called the data generator, which, creatively enough, is used to automatically generate data that you can use in your tests. So here I'm going to do a quick recording against a, um, a different version of the orders application. You've all seen me uh, probably work with this at one point or another. I'm going to start recording a new test and I'm just going to place a new order inside this particular uh, application. All right, great. Order is new order. And let's fill this in. Let's say that, uh, you know, John Smith and we've got uh, one, two, three, my street, and we'll give him a state and a credit card number of one, and we'll say okay. All right, great. So now I'm going to stop recording, and test complete will render those commands just like always. But now let's say that once the com you know the the test is finished out, we don't always want to be entering John Smith over and over again. We want to try doing this for a bunch of different users with a bunch of different data. Previously, what you would have had to have done is created an Excel file or something like that that had all that information for you. And you would have either needed to have done that um, in, you know, by hand, or you would have needed to go to a website like datagenerator.com or, or something like that. Well, now you can build that data right inside of Test Complete. Let me show you how to do that. You come up here to the Tools menu, and you go to Generate Data. That's going to pop up this wizard. And this wizard says, OK, we're going to create some random data. Do we want to store that data inside of a variable, inside our test complete project, or do you want to create a Microsoft Excel worksheet with all that information in it? For purposes today, I'm going to create a table variable, and I'm going to call that variable customer info. And now you can also specify where that table is going to live. You could make it at the project level, or you could assign it to a particular test. So I could put it in test one or test two. But for right now, I'm going to keep it up at the project level so that all my tests can access it. 
All right, so I've got that. I'll click Next. And now this is where we can specify what sort of data we want to work with. So I want to create a name, an address, and a state for my uh, user information. Okay, so first thing I want to do, I'm going to click in this column name here, and I'm going to type in username because I want to make names. And now in this data type, you can click on this drop-down, and you get a list of 19 presets of different types of data that you could build. So in my case, I want a name. And now you can configure that name even further by clicking this configure button right here. And this allows you to assign, you know, maybe you just want uh, male names, maybe you just want female names, maybe you want a mix, you know, any name regardless. And you can also narrow this down. Maybe we, just, we want full names, maybe we just want first names, maybe we just want last names. And you can specify how many of those you want. Um, for right now, I'm just going to do uh, one of those. All right. And then I'll do it again. Insert. Now we want a uh, street address. So we'll say user address in this column. And for data type, again, I'll just come down here and, hey, you know, how convenient. We've got a street address selection. So I'm going to choose that. And then finally, uh, we'll do one more for the uh, user state. And again, there's a state field we can choose from. Now, if the type of information you want isn't specified by default, you know, maybe you've got a special uh, format you want to work with, like credit card numbers or, um, you know, something like that, you can create your own custom data uh, in here. You can click the insert, and then in the data type, you can choose custom string. And then there's some logic you can build into that string in order to make it match the appropriate pattern that you care about. And there's full information in the help file that will walk you through how to actually do that. Okay, but for right now, I'm just going to keep those three fields, and we'll click Finish. All right, and now Test Complete has generated that table variable for me, and we can see what's inside it by clicking right here. And here we go. There's a list of all the information that got auto-generated for me. So now I've got 100 unique usernames, addresses, and states. So I don't need to worry about typing everything out. I can just go ahead and have Test Complete build that for me. You saw how fast that went by. It was a grand total of, what, maybe 1.5 seconds to build that data out. That's a whole lot faster than I could type. So this definitely makes your life a lot easier uh, when you're working with Test Complete. And then once you've got that table variable built, you can incorporate it into your keyword tests just like you normally would with the uh, data-driven testing wizard. So you'd select all the actions that you cared about, right-click, say Make Data Loop from the uh, context menu that gets displayed. That brings up this wizard, and now it says, okay, which variable do you want to work with? In our case, we're going to work with that customer info table variable. We click Next. All right, we're going to choose table variable from the type. And now this lets you review your data one more time before you actually commit to it. So if we wanted to change one of these values or if we wanted to insert rows or columns or whatever, we could do that. For right now, I'm just going to take the false, click Next. Again, just like what you're used to with a regular data loop, you can specify a subset of the records that are being shown. So maybe you only want to do uh, records 5 through 27. You can specify that. And we click Next. And then, again, just like what you're used to, uh, this is where the rubber meets the road, and you can update the hard-coded values with the values from the table variable. So I'm going to change this John Smith to the username column. We'll change the street to the user address field, and then the state to the user state. And when I click Finish, there you go. You can see we've got our uh, data loop has been inserted in here, and here is our uh, hard-coded values have now been updated with the values from the table variable. So really easy to auto-generate data and then use that data in your tests. You know, the whole process, if I hadn't been stopping to, to narrate along the way, probably wouldn't have taken me any more than a minute or two. So really improves the, the speed of your, your testing there. All right, so we've talked about a bunch of improvements that have been made to the functional testing side of things. Uh, so let's shift gears a little bit now and talk about some load testing improvements. So I'm going to go ahead and add the ability to do load testing to my test complete project. This part's exactly the same, so you know, we're just going to add that right in there. And I'm going to uh, close my browsers down because I want to have test complete auto launch that for me. Okay, and I'm going to click on this record load testing task button. All right, so now Test Complete's going to pop up this little uh, message that says, uh, you know, what do you want to call your load test? 
I'm just going to keep the defaults for right now, and it's letting me choose which browser I want to use. Again, I'll keep the defaults and click OK. So now Test Complete is going to pop up and take me to my Okay, and folks, um, I understand there may be a little bit of a audio disconnect there. Uh, can everybody hear me again? Can you just go ahead and type type sound in there? If uh, you can, all right. Yeah, what happens sometimes when you're recording HTTP traffic is test completes recording everything. And unfortunately, one of those things is go to webinar. So I had a little bit of a disconnect when that happens. I should have warned you about that before I started the recording process. I apologize for that. Okay, so what I just did was I recorded logging in to my website. I, and then I searched for Amazon stock, and then I logged out. So now, let's go ahead and take a look at what got recorded. So I'm going to double click on my task file here. Now the first change that I want to point out here is that we are now grouping all the requests that get made during the course of our uh, recording sessions by page. So right here you can see we're on this, the login page right here. And then you know, here's the login.aspx page, and here are all the requests that were associated with that. Here's the actual home page itself. So previously, we would be grouping these requests by connection, um, whereas now we're showing them by page. So there's no ambiguity about what each file that you're downloading or what information you're requesting, you know, what page that's associated with. I know that when I'm getting this button underscore BG JPEG file, that that's a direct result of hitting this login page. Okay, now. Uh, so that's that's one really nice thing. And if you decide you want to go back to the old way, if that makes more sense to you because you're used to it, you can just right click here and say group by connections. And then that'll flip back to the old way of grouping connections. Um, you know, and that'll make it, uh, you know, the, yeah, the old way. Okay, good, Nick, move on. All right. Yes, I shall. Okay. Um, now, the next thing I want to talk about is it's a lot easier now to insert think time into your load tests. You know, chances are when you are running a load test, you want to emulate your user's behavior. So you can see right here this think time column that's inside this grid is showing you the amount of time I paused in between each request that was being made. And the biggest one of those is right here on the login page. You can see I waited for almost 13 seconds from the time I hit the login page until the time I actually clicked the login button. So you may want to emulate your user scenarios like that, you know, because your users probably need a second to think about what stock they want to search for, what travel package they want to buy, what books they want to pick up. You know, so by inserting think time, you can make those scenarios a little more reflective of the real world. Um, so I can now right click on this item and say change think time if I want. That brings up this little dialogue that would let me edit the amount of think time I had. You know, maybe I only wanted to do this for seven seconds instead of uh, you know, 13 seconds. You just put that time in here in milliseconds and click OK. If you want to apply this think time globally to every request in your load test, you know, maybe you say, all right, everything that my user does, there should always be a seven second wait after every request gets made. You can click this apply to all requests checkbox. And now everything will have a seven second wait time. I don't want to do that for right now, though. I just want to edit that one value. So I'll click OK. And now you can see we're down to a seven second uh, wait there. Now it's also a lot easier to modify specific requests that have been made uh, in your load testing. You see right here, these are the values that I was sending when I logged into my website, John Smith and Pass123. Let's say I want to change that. You know, previously in Test Complete, you would have had to have written some code in order to manipulate this information. Now you just click inside this editor and make the desired change. You know, maybe your password is XXX. There you go. You put that in there and you're done. But the other thing that's new and exciting here is the ability to easily parameterize this information. So chances are you don't want to always be logging in as John Smith. You've probably got, you know, two or, you know, 300 users that you want to be logging in as. Previously, again, you would have had to have written code, but now, now we've made it wizard based. So here, to do that, all you need to do is you double click on the load testing node right here in your test complete project. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Double click right there. And that, oh, nope, not that one. Sorry, the tasks node. Getting so excited I'm getting ahead of myself on what I want to show you guys. So you double click on the tasks node. And I'm going to click this new variable button. 
you give your variable a name. So let's say, you know, I'll be really creative here and call this username. Okay, so I've got that set up, and now I'm going to click the next button. Okay. Now you can specify where your uh, information is going to come from. You can pull it in from a list. You can pull it in from a database. You can generate random values. For right now, I want to choose list variable and click next. And now, very similar to what you just saw me do with the data generation wizard, I'm going to click this generate button. And I'm going to say, all right, I want to generate 100 rows. I want to generate a custom string. And my custom string is going to be like this. It's going to be UID colon, and then this information right here. Because, believe it or not, all the usernames in this website follow this format, UID colon 1 through whatever. Okay. So this is some of that special logic. I see somebody asked about regular expressions. Um, this doesn't support direct regular expressions. You do use these patterns here. But again, the help file does talk about um, the patterns that you can use in order to generate these items. So we're going to go ahead and build out these samples here. Click OK. All right, there's all my usernames now. I'll click Next. And now this screen is where we're going to specify how the virtual users are going to use the information in this variable. The one that we want to use is the one that's currently selected, item index equals virtual user index, which basically means virtual user 1 is going to get the first item in the variable. So virtual user 1 will get UID number 1, and virtual user 2 will get UID 2, and so on and so forth. So we're going to pick that and click Finish. All right, fantastic. So now we've got that built. Now we can come back to our task file, and I'm going to come over here to John Smith, and I'm going to click this drop-down arrow that's next to his name. And you can see we've got that variable now at username. So I'm just going to select that. And now when we run this load task, test complete will automatically pull from that variable and use the information in that list instead of the hard-coded value of John Smith. So again, no coding needed. Just one little pass through a wizard and you're good to go. So now, let's go ahead. I'm going to set up my test here. I'm just going to double click on this. And let's say we want, uh, I'll keep this simple, let's say 15 virtual users. Okay. Go ahead and we'll get that going. Now, the next thing I want to mention before I actually kick this off is that TestComplete 8.1 includes server-side monitoring for its load tests. So this allows you to keep track of system resources on the server that's hosting your web application. So let's go ahead and, and take a look at that. Um, to set that up, you double-click on the load testing node right here, and then you click on this Runtime Graphs tab that you see down the bottom of my screen. And this shows you a list of some of the counters that you can track during the course of a load test. All right, so for example, you can see that we can monitor the number of virtual users, the amount of time that the server is spending thinking. Um, I also want to monitor the speed of the requests and the number of errors that are being generated during the course of my load test. So we can track those items. But you know what? We can track more than just that. In fact, test complete allows you to set up your own custom counters if you're interested. So what I'm going to do here is right click and I'm just going to say counters from that drop down menu that, that pops up. Okay, and now what we're going to do is we're going to click the add button in the ensuing wizard and you specify the name of your host. In my case, my local host is called Vera. So I'm going to put in Vera here and then click use standard counter. Okay, now test complete is going to connect up to Vera and it's going to fetch information about Vera. Okay, so we can, by default, we can verify the, you know, or excuse me, we can watch the percentage of the CPU, the percentage of memory, the amount of memory in use in megabytes, and the percentage of disk time. So I'm going to add the percent CPU counter. I can also specify what color I want this to be. Um, you know, this green is kind of hard on the eyes, so I'm going to make this a little more uh, palatable. I'll make it a darker green. I can also change the name here. CPU Vera may not be helpful. I want to change that to CPU Web Server. And we'll click Finish. And you can see, okay, great, we've got that in there. But now I also want to add the amount of memory that's being used in megabytes because, you know, I, I may have a lot of memory on my server, so the percentage may be kind of misleading to watch that. I want to see exactly how much is being consumed. So I'll put that in there. And again, we want to get away from this yucky green color. I'll go ahead and click Finish. So that's great, but you know what? Somebody out there may be saying, well, Nick, that's, that's fantastic that you've got those four or five presets, but you know what? I really want to see what happens on my network interface, uh, total bytes sent and received, just like I would in Perfmon. Well, you know what? Test Complete can do that, too. So let's go ahead. I'm going to click the Add button right here, and I'm going to select Choose Custom Counter. 
And now here you go. Here's all the Perfmon counters that exist on this system. And any single one of these can be picked and monitored. So just like you would using Perfmon, you can watch this. So that scenario I just mentioned would be network interface, then the name of the network card that I care about, and the bytes total sent and received per second. We're also reading in the information that Microsoft provides about each counter. So again, there's very little ambiguity about what a particular counter does. All right, so I've got that. I'll click Next. You know what? I'm just going to take the green this time. Click Finish, and then click OK. So now we've got those three counters have been added here. All right, fantastic. But now what do those counters look like when a test is actually running? I'm so glad you asked. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to run this load test. And now test complete is going to fire off. It's going to run those 15 users. Each user will get their own username and password, just like what you saw me uh, do earlier. And now we're going to, here we go, here come the server side graphs. So this is monitoring live in real time exactly what's happening on my server. So there's no ambiguity about you know trying to manually correlate a perfmon graph to what a test complete test is doing. We can see that as these tests are running, we know exactly where the uh, test runs. So this is a very short load test, so we didn't get a whole lot of data there, but it's important to, to mention that that information uh, was being tracked. And then the other thing I want to mention is we also have this new execution progress tab. Let me go ahead and run this load test again. The execution progress tab shows you the total number of virtual users that are participating in the load test and the current percentage that they've completed so far. So you can see in that state column on the right hand side of my screen, each virtual user is now 80% complete uh, for their load testing task. So if you can see uh, as the tests run, you know, whether or not users finish out, that kind of skipped by real quick. I'm hoping that you guys are able to see it. But like half of my users went to 100% and the other half stayed at 80 for a second there. And then they switched over to um, a full 100% and then the test finishes out. Okay, so I know we've covered a lot of ground really fast here, so uh, hopefully you know this was, was helpful for you guys. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to jump over to a couple more slides before we turn things over to the Q&A portion of the presentation. I see some folks are asking questions. That's great. Keep those coming. I will be getting those uh, in just a minute. So here we go. Let me jump back into PowerPoint. We've also made some performance improvements in Test Complete 8.1. We've really worked hard on making name mapping and the visualizer more efficient with how much memory that they use. So in name mapping's case, some of you may have encountered issues where if you had a really big name mapping file, you may have encountered uh, out of memory errors. We've fixed those. The visualizer, we've sped up in speed improvements on that. Yeah, we've made speed improvements on that as well. In general, we found that we're moving you know, one and a half to two times faster, and a whole lot faster when you're working with Silverlight and Firefox. So we've worked really hard to make this a speedier and snappier version of Test Complete. Test Complete 8.1 also provides support for a bunch of new technologies. I mentioned some of these earlier. Um, so here's a quick list of those items. I'm not going to bore anybody by reading the list to you, but suffice to say that we've made it so that Test Complete can record against several new environments and can integrate with others. Okay, now, if you are having trouble getting your licenses installed, um, we've now included an online troubleshooter that can help walk you through a series of questions to help resolve your issues. Now, this is an extremely long URL, and it will be very cruel of me to expect everybody in the audience to copy this URL down in 10 seconds' time. So what I've just done is sent it out to everybody via the chat panel. So if you look at your GoToWebinar toolbar, you should see this little blinking uh, text box. If you click on that, that'll open up the panel. You'll see the link inside there. You can just copy it right out of that dialog and paste it for later um, use. OK. Now, let's turn things over to the questions you folks have. One more time, just to reiterate, the question session is only intended for topics we've covered today. So if you have a tech support issue, uh, you have questions about, you know, does Test Complete run on Windows 7? Does Test Complete, you know, work in virtual machines? Things like that. This is not the right avenue to ask those kinds of questions. Um, please send those over to our support team or your account rep, and he or she will help you out. All right, so here we go. Let's uh, scroll through the list of questions here. I'm just pulling that up right now. Bear with me for one second as I find the first question, which is from, okay, Evelyn asks, is there a way to programmatically set think times in load testing? Uh, yes, Test Complete does allow you to script at the HTTP request level. So if you want to programmatically modify that think time, you certainly can do that. Okay, 
Uh, Chris asks, is load testing applied only to web applications? Yes, test complete load testing is intended for HTTP or HTTPS based applications. Okay. Um, Alan asks, capturing the dynamic list of a combo box dropdown is kind of a pain. Can the set variable value action do this for me? Yeah, Alan, you know, you could set it equal to the uh, WItem list property of that uh, combo box, and then at runtime, test complete would be fetching in the values from that uh, combo box. Okay. Um, let's see, Nick asks, uh, testing with Firefox in TC8, I encountered duplicate objects. Has this been fixed in TC8.1? Um, good question, Nick. I'm not sure. It uh, would be best if you uh, checked out in the help file. There's a list of fixed issues, or you can send a, a note off to our support team, and they can help you out uh, figuring out if that is fixed. Uday asks, does the file comparison wizard work for all kinds of file formats? It works best against uh, text-based files. Um, but we do have some information in the help file that talks about other types of files you can work with there. So I recommend you check that out uh, to see if what you're looking for is included there. Dennis asks, what new DevExpress components are you supporting with this version? I will find that out for you, Dennis, and have your account rep get back to you. So Dennis, new DevEx components support. Michael asks, can the new load testing be used um, on different machines with an agent? Yes, there is an agent included with the load testing portion of Test Complete, so you can have multiple machines served as load generators. Let's see. Um, can the think time be easily randomized? I don't believe it can right now, Scott. I think you'd be just setting it to um, hard-coded values uh, right now, but you could programmatically manipulate it to be uh, random, kind of like what we were talking about earlier. You could script that out and then have it go from there. Uh, let's see. Is load testing included in the enterprise license? Uh, it is a separate fee, and you should talk with your account manager to uh, get pricing information there. Uh, next question, is the upgrade from TC8 to 8.1 free? Yes, provided that you are current on your maintenance. And if you uh, aren't sure, you can send a message to your account rep, and he or she can help you out there. Does Test Complete 8.1 support Power Builder 12? Yes, it does. Um, let's see, a question from Zahi is asking, how can I hear this webinar again? Uh, there will be a recording made available shortly after uh, this live session is done. It'll probably be sent out to everybody either the end of this week or early next week. Uh, another question around load testing. Do you need additional licenses for load testing? Yes, you do need additional licenses for load testing. Um, you can speak with your account rep for uh, specific information about the costs and um, models around that. All right, great questions, folks. I'm just looking through here to make sure there's there's no other ones here. Um, if I did skip a few folks' questions because those were tech support type questions. So if you have uh, questions around, you know, you're you're having issues with uh, timing or you know with a specific application, best to speak with the support team uh, about that. Um, or you know, if you have questions about supported environments, things like that. Okay. Um, Let's see. Next question. Does Test Complete 8.1 support Farpoint or LaSalle controls? Uh, no, Jason, we, we don't have support for those types of environments. And uh, next question. Can Test Complete be used for testing progress based applications? And again, no, we don't have uh, special support for that. Okay. Great questions, folks. Um, if you do have other questions that uh, we didn't get to during the course of this session. Just send those over to your account manager, and he or she will help you out. But just to want to remind everybody before we, we close out here that we, with all the new features that we've just put out, you may want some refresher training on Test Complete. And we do have several training options available. So if you're interested, give your account rep a call, and he or she will provide you with the most current dates and pricing information about, um, about that training. Got a question from Matt saying, are there any upcoming webinars we should know about? Matt, it's like you're a plant. Yes. In fact, before we shut down today, I do want to mention that we're going to be hosting a special three-part webinar series on web testing with Test Complete. Each part will correspond to a different aspect of web testing, 
and all of our customers will receive an email with the dates and times for these webinars. We're going to be hosting these sometime uh, in December. So uh, just keep an eye on your inbox for those. All right, folks, so that's everything I wanted to cover today. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. If you enjoyed today's presentation, my name is Nick. If you did not enjoy today's presentation, my name is Rodney. Thanks a lot, folks, and have yourselves a great afternoon.